7 News at 10 right now on top of breaking news, and it is a tragic story out of Longmont tonight. Police just getting a search warrant and going inside this home in the 1600 block of Green Place. That's where a pregnant woman was stabbed and her baby taken from her. Sadly, the baby did not survive. Now, right now, police are still processing the crime scene behind me. They still have the house taped off with a crime scene tape, but it all started with a Craigslist ad, the suspect luring the pregnant woman to her home, promising to sell her baby items. Police tape now surrounding the home where the victim showed up around 2.30 this afternoon. Police say that's when the suspect attacked her, stabbed her, and then cut her unborn baby from her womb. The victim, alone in that home, called 911. Police, they're understandably upset. Now, the mother was rushed to the hospital and underwent surgery. She is expected to survive. Now, here's where it gets really twisted. Police say the suspect showed up at Longmont United Hospital with her husband and the deceased baby, claiming she had a miscarriage. Now, they arrested her, but say her husband really believed she had a miscarriage. Police are not commenting on whether the suspect was at one time pregnant. Now, they're not releasing the suspect's name yet. What happened to the to Michelle? Because there was excellent crime scene work done by the Longmont Police Department. <clears throat> the evidence that you'll hear, the forensic evidence, will help you figure out what happened, both from the Longmont Police Department and from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. <clears throat> now, I should mention that this is what. The evidence will show. And I'll go through it fairly quickly because you're going to get tired of hearing about this, I suggest. But let me make sure it's clear what the basic facts are of the attack on Michelle and her baby. Sometime after 1 p.m., and we're able to figure this out pretty precisely again with text messages and cell phones, we think actually right around 1:11 p.m. on March 18th, the defendant got Michelle down these stairs into the basement, got her back into room number 10, where she hit her over the head with a lava lamp. Remember lava lamps? You're old enough to remember lava lamps? Hit her over the head with a lava lamp, which broke in its thick glass. She took a piece of the lava lamp and stabbed Michelle in the neck with it. And as blood was splurting from Michelle's neck, she choked her, pushed her down on the bed, held a pillow over her until she was unconscious, and then using two different knives, cut her abdomen, cut Aurora, the baby out. Aurora by then was dead, and carried Aurora upstairs and laid her dead. The forensic evidence is quite comprehensive, and Michelle, surprisingly, remembers a lot of this. After she did this, she then spent an hour or so cleaning up. As Michelle lay dying on the bed, she moved her aside, took the sheets off, took the mattress pad off, did two loads of laundry, took the pillows and put them in a trash bag and hid them under a crib, took a towel, washed it with a bunch of bleach, took the sheet off the bed, and put it in the washing machine. During the time that Michelle was lying on that bed, eviscerated, disemboweled, the defendant went in and out of the room five, six times in cleaning expeditions to try to clean up, trying frantically to convert her fake pregnancy into a fake stillbirth. After she stopped moving, I got scared. And I started thinking about the baby. But it wasn't long after that that my husband came home. What were you thinking about with the baby? I thought I killed her. I was like, I killed this woman. They always tell you not to do things 
by yourself on Craigslist, but I didn't. I'm, it was a pregnant woman. I didn't think anything of it. Okay, so what happened when she went, was unconscious before your husband got home? It was just a momentary reaction. I I was thinking that, you know, I was like, oh my God, I, I thought I killed her and I, I, I didn't know that the baby to die too. What happened? We know it's hard. I'm not this kind of person. I don't, I don't do stuff like this. Like, I didn't know what to do. Ugh. I'm not judging you by now. I know. I know. I, I'm judging myself. <laughs> What do you see when a situation like that? Like I just I reacted. I When she stopped moving, I just started thinking I didn't want the baby to die too, so I got the knife that she had. And I couldn't find it. He came to the door just as I was coming back upstairs. I did. Before I took the baby upstairs, I did. I, I did try and. She wasn't crying when you removed her. When I went back down, when I went back downstairs to find my phone, <coughs> the girl was moaning and she was crying. No, she wasn't crying. She, she was just making like breathing sounds. And I got scared. This is a lady in the basement. <laughs> okay, where'd you put the baby when you took the baby upstairs? In the bathtub. Okay. It was empty. I just I just sat her in there. Okay. Okay, so she was moaning and making some noise. I should have said something then, but I didn't. I just got scared. What happened? I just 
Whose baby did he think it was? Ours. Are you pregnant? Did he think you've been pregnant? I wanted to tell him so bad. I was pregnant. I was pregnant. When were you pregnant? Was she trying to choke you? Before, um, throughout, really, the whole time, she was trying to choke me. Okay. And at some point, did you pass out? I did. After she broke the bottle over my head and stabbed me, um, and she was trying to choke <coughs> me, I remember she, I remember um, thinking of Aurora and feeling like, I really, I just thought of her and I felt like I wanted to survive also for her and so I fought back harder and I remember she got up, she went, she was straddling me before and she went further up and actually pinned down my arms um, yeah. with her knees. Can I approach her? Yeah. She um, pinned down my arms with her legs okay. and actually used, um, I remember she was trying so hard to check me and then she, when she got closer she just bore it down with her whole weight on the heel of her hand over my windpipe and I just remember everything going black. Okay. Now, did you ever see the defender with a knife? I didn't. Okay. I didn't. After you went everything went black. Um, tell the jury what you remember next. So, I woke up on the floor of the room and I remember my first instinct was to get up and I just felt this really intense pain in my stomach. And Ms. Wilkins, do you know how long you had been passed out? No. All right, so you woke up, you're on the floor, you weren't on a bed. Okay. And I tried to move, um, and I just felt this really intense pain in my stomach. And I looked down, and you know, I just saw this really big cut across my stomach. And um, I pulled my pants for you know high waisted pregnancy pants, so I I pulled them up, and I started looking around <coughs> the room. Things started coming back about you know how she had attacked me, so. You know, I kind of started thinking, maybe she's still in the house, should I go? I can't outrun her, you know, if I'm in so much pain, I can't outrun her if I go through the front door. And there was a window, um, and I was kind of putting together an escape plan in my head, you know, should I climb out the window or make a run further? And the first thing I thought I would do was, um, just block the door, and so I just stood up and um, 
my legs, my feet couldn't support me, so I just fell forward and on top of my hand. And when I did that, I just felt the blood seeping through my pants. And, and I could feel my intestines outside of my body. Okay. And so I could... It's, is it fair to say you didn't think you could climb out the window? Yes. Okay. Did you try to shut the door? I willed myself to stand and stumble towards the door. And, um, you know, my vision felt really blurry, so I feel like, you know, I, like, closed the lock or put the lock, and when I turned around next to the bed, we're still both of our cell phones. I guess it was hers. I saw mine and another cell phone. And so I just stumbled back to the bed and laid down on my back to, and picked up my phone. Okay, so you picked up your phone to call 911. Yes. And were you able to call 911? I was. Okay, um, now did you put your your uh, code into your phone? No, it's like my I kept trying to put my code in and I my fingers were fumbling and so it accidentally swiped onto the emergency screen, so I ended up just making the call from there. Okay. And uh, somebody answered at 911? Yes. And uh, you were on the phone for a while? I was. Yes. Were you able to give him the address? Yes. And then what happened? So, um, I don't really remember much of the conversation, um, only that, you know, I was talking for the whole duration. And, and they kept saying, I kept asking for help um, because, you know, just staying present was really difficult at the time. And so they kept saying that help was going, to, they were on their way. And um, eventually I actually heard the cops knock on the door and I told that, I told her that they were there, that the police were there. Okay. All, of course, very welcome to be here. I do want to remind everybody um, in terms of the expectations of the court uh, when reading the verdict and after the verdict um, in terms of people reacting, responding, um, I don't want to have to have anybody removed. It's appropriate, of course, for you to um, sit here and to listen and to observe, but to not do anything. Jury verdict count number one, criminal attempt to commit first degree murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Dinell Catrice Lane, guilty of attempt to commit murder in the first degree. We further find, with respect to the verdict questions for this count, as follows. Did Ms. Lane use or possess and threaten the use of a deadly weapon? Yes. Did Ms. Lane cause serious bodily injury or death? Yes. Jury verdict count number two. Assault in the first degree, throat area by means of hands, a knife, or cutting instrument. We, the jury, find the defendant, Dinell Catrice Lane, guilty of count number two, assault in the first degree. Jury verdict count number three, assault in the first degree, abdomen area by means of a knife or cutting instrument. We, the jury, find the defendant, Dinell Catrice Lane, Guilty of count number three, assault in the first degree. Jury verdict count number four, assault in the second degree, head area by means of a bludgeon. We, the jury, find the defendant, Dinell Catrice Lane, guilty of count number four, assault in the second degree. Jury verdict count number five, Assault in the second degree, throat area by means of hands. We, the jury, find the defendant, Dinell Catrice Lane, guilty of count number five, assault in the second degree. Jury verdict count number six, unlawful termination of a pregnancy in the first degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Dinell Catrice Lane, guilty of unlawful termination of a pregnancy in the first degree.
Judge Maria Birkenkotter, stern and commanding on behalf of the victims. People are hungry to hear from Ms. Lane, to hear why you did this, hungry to desperate to hear you explain what happened to Aurora. Birkenkotter sentenced Dinell Lane to 100 years in prison. Because of Colorado laws, the majority of charges in this case were related to Wilkins injuries, not the harm inflicted on the unborn child. Another telling comment from the judge today. She said, quote, there's always been the question of whether Miss Lane killed Michelle and tried to take Aurora because she wanted a baby or merely because she wanted proof that she was pregnant. The judge said those are two very different things. Those are two profoundly disturbing things. Again, Dinell Lane will spend 100 years behind bars.